Hello, Internet. It's uh, it's been a while. I got a haircut. I I have a beard. It um that's what happens when you don't shave. The current situation has been interesting, but it has allowed me to explore a certain part of my interests a lot. Um, so I don't know how to explain this, but I fucking love horror. I mm, I love horror. A lot of horror is shit. A lot of horror is amazing. Horror is either like a 10 or a 1 on the scale. There are, there's, mm, else that's how I experience it. What, um, I think that makes my love of horror a little bit complicated is that I suffer from generalized anxiety disorder, uh, which means uh, I'm fucking scared all the time. For example, I don't like watching horror movies a lot. I, I watch some once in a while, but they have to be very good and I have to be in a very comfortable environment and not alone, um, which living with a partner definitely, you know, helps. So, it's getting better. But I've recently, like in the last few years, discovered a specific author who um, really captures what I like about horror. Um, So, there was an essay written about the difference between horror and terror. I am citing a guy I like on the internet who cited this person and then I read that essay and I was like that's real good thinking I don't remember what it is I will link it in the description Um, it's really fascinating and I quite like it because it captures how I feel terror is a thing that the essay uses a lot and terror is the feeling of a jump scare of the camera suddenly cutting and oh there's a skeleton right it's cheap it gets a fright out of people like it it works we have seen like internet clicker games it works but it's not particularly interesting right um and especially on this channel that's dedicated to tabletop role-playing games terror a terror role-playing game gets boring (laughs) just the dm like peeking out of the screen doesn't work it also talks about horror Now, what's the difference between horror and terror? So, horror is when something is so awful that you cannot look away. When you know that something is real fucked up, but you have to look. Horror is when you drive past a car crash and you have to look. That's an awful part of human beings, but we fucking do it anyway. And it's disgusting. One author really captured my imagination with this. His name was Howard something F. P. Lovecraft. He's real fucking good at this. Um, There's a short story called Dagon about a guy experiencing some stuff and writing it down and it's amazing. He is so good at what really got me was in the beginning of this period I read at the Mountains of Madness by him and fucking nothing happens. Uh, nothing happens until like point of no return to climax like up until then it's just build up but that build up just slowly drips feeds you information and I want to know fucking more and it's great there are some downsides to Lovecraft he is it's comic how big of a racist he is it's it's comical how big of a racist he is fucking I love the Call of Cthulhu sub story, uh, short story, is great. It's so hard to read. He is so it cannot. By the standards of his time, he was fucking racist. Joking, coming. I'm white. I can deal with that. He's also homophobic. I'm pan. Can't deal with that. So we gotta we gotta do some death of the author shit here. Joke end. We still gotta do some death to the shit here. That's why I prefer the term cosmic horror instead of Lovecraftian horror, because I don't really feel like he should get. I don't like idolizing dead racists. Oh, unless we killed them. Um, 
future video. <laughs> but the concept of fear of the unknown and needing to know more and mysteries are wonderful. And I love fucking... I recently watched Get Out with my partner and Parasite because they have great movies that I've heard a lot about. And they do this drip feeding of information and you want to know more. You know that this is going to end awful. Like, there's no way the situation doesn't go bad. No way. The situation will be hell. We are going there anyway. Which is surprising what the Call of Cthulhu short story is about. And what Call of Cthulhu the role-playing game is about. The Call of Cthulhu was a thing that um, Cthulhu did where uh, they sent out dreams. I prefer referring to Cthulhu as gender-neutral pronouns because I don't think Dragon Daddy has a dick. They just sent out fucking dreams and people were like, we gotta go fucking investigate that. And they went and died and all became cultists. And that captures the entire theme of this. Dungeons and Dragons, we got adventurers. Or heroes, or whatever the fuck they're actually called. Call of Cthulhu calls its characters investigators. I like that. I like that it's a game set up for investigating. And looking at a stupid mystery and being like, I can solve this. If I do, I'm probably going to get very badly hurt. But I'm going to do it anyway. So... Call of Cthulhu also has a benefit that I quite enjoy, that it's it's very down-to-earth when it isn't concerned with fighting mystical horror beings. You're just, you know, people who um, have a job and fuck around. So, what is this? Outside of being an introduction to why I fucking love Call of Cthulhu and horror despite having anxiety... I really like running horror role-playing games. And this is going to be a campaign diary of me running a Call of Cthulhu campaign that I'm writing myself. And also just talking about Call of Cthulhu and stuff like that. Because uh, I like self-evaluating. And I figured I might as well record it and put it on the internet. Because Call of Cthulhu doesn't have enough content, man. Just, just not enough. So... I'm spitting in the bucket. What is this campaign? What's the point? There was a lecture by uh, this guy, Sandy Peterson. He's on the book, goddammit. Uh, he wrote it originally fucking ages ago. Uh, and he talks about writing ghost, good ghost stories. And um, he st starts out talking about one of Lovecraft's favorite ghost story writers. And I, uh, probably true, but that person had three... Um, like good things about writing ghost stories and there's something about not using jargon and that the ghost has to be evil but f yeah okay Th there are good lessons there but I'm not particularly concerned with it what's really what really got me was that it has to be a place that the players can see themselves in if you're writing a ghost story on a spaceship like Make it so that they feel like they could actually be there. Like, he gives the example of, well, you couldn't have Call of Cthulhu on a Star Trek spaceship because it's just too fucking pretty and everything works. Whereas Alien has a shitty spaceship. People are talking about wages and not getting enough and just contract shit. And you can relate to that. You can relate to having a shitty boss and a shitty job. He actually talk, um, Sandy talks about running in the like uh, Stone Ages and being like, yeah, just focus on community and the friendship you have with people. Like, there's some very good lessons there uh, about running in places that isn't now, but that's the easiest way to fucking do it. Just what's the date? Thirteenth, thirtieth of August, twenty twenty. I. That's the day our adventure's going. It, it just helps imagining it. As well as um, run it in a town you know. Um, I There's benefit. I have d and I have fucking made up towns and just have an idea of the layout and just improvised it. But there's been something beautiful about running it in the city that I live with. I have two players. All of us live in this city. 
we know it pretty well. It's like top five largest cities in Denmark. It's not huge, but it's pretty big. And it helps so much. You really get to describe things. Like we go to, we are somewhere and we go to the nearest cafe and we actually know what cafe that is. Stuff like that. And we know how the library looks. It just helps imagining actually being there. So, I would say what this campaign is about, but I can't say that, as the players fucking don't know. Um, but what it is, is uh, idiots trying not to die while they figure out some stuff. So, we are in 2020, we are in August, it's late summer, the heat has just died down. Uh... We are choosing not just to ignore everything that's happening with uh, the virus and just... Um, we're doing this for escapism. We don't have time for that bullshit. Like, that, that's not entertaining. But everything else is pretty much the same. They rolled up some characters. And on the one hand, we have Yen. A photojournalist who's early 40s single wonderful person um has a cute dog that works at uh, that gets checked up at the other character's place leo slot uh, leo slot is a veterinarian who has his own clinic and uh, stuff like that he has a secretary who there's a weird relationship with and we shouldn't worry about that um and he has an accountant that the players hadn't met yet and that's fun so uh, they meet Leo just finished visiting a client, like, <laughs> on an electric bicycle, <laughs> visited the client. Um, Jan was walking the dog on the, like, uh, harbor in Olborg. That's a beautiful place. Um, and suddenly they hear a homeless guy uh, yelling about something, like, what the fuck's that? And they see a large ice block. Uh, iceberg might be more correct, but it's 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 a bit too small to be a proper iceberg. Like this couldn't have killed Titanic; it could have killed a smaller boat, though. And oh, they swear they see something inside of it. Ian hurries up and takes a couple of pictures. And uh, then a guy in a blue hazmat suit walks up to them and asks them to get the fuck off and starts threatening them, while other people in hazmat suits start covering this iceberg in tops and setting up tents and a van arrives where more people come out from and <laughs> fence is put up to prevent people from looking at this thing. And um, luckily, <laughs> they are saved by um, one of this organization's higher-ups, uh, who seems to have control of this mission, who seems slightly peeved that... Um, one of her men is busy yelling at people and talk to them quite diplomatically, get their names so that they can be contacted later to see what did they see. And um, she's mildly threatening, but that's okay. Also, they have they have white eyes for some reason. Like, just white eyes. Still people do. Oh, yeah. Also, when I do horror, I like doing makeup. Was this a coincidence? I think not. Good. So, after a bit of talking, they talk to the homeless guy who is very suspicious of this place and do a bit of yelling and convince them that this organization is bad and that this organization is referred to as NOSU. Whatever that means. Um, they head over to a local pub. I'll talk a bit to the bartender about this. Um, and uh, while the bartender gets told about this nose of things, they say the name a bit loud. And a suspicious person maybe looks at them. Nah, that's probably not anything. Uh, the suspicious person left. That's, that's fine. Um, so the photojournalist get out his, gets out his laptop, uh, opens up Photoshop, does some enhancing of shit. And, uh, I know I use Photoshop. You can't do too much, but they did some. Um, they also got a picture of uh, the Nosu uh, officer in 
like on the phone and they got some of the ice block iceberg so there's some information they can get there and they find out that what's in the iceberg is humanoid like there's an outline of a face not optimal oh well it's at least interesting so they did some googling the well i fucked up that library use skill Ooh. Uh, as it is a not well known organization, um, uh, they um, they stumble on Nosferatu fan fiction, which was mm, it was weird, and I had to describe that. That was fun. I have great players, by the way. They were laughing their ass off with this. Uh, so they also found out through some further work that NOSO is connected to the United Nations. My players didn't exactly know what the United Nations was. So they had some no roles and we did some Googling, like out of character and did some explanation, which was very fun because there were major hints there and I don't know if they picked up on many of them. That's, it's real great. Um, NOSO uh, was part of the International Planet to Prevent Climate Change, I think it's called, IPCC. It's focused on Scandinavia and the North Pole. I don't remember if it's Arctic or Antarctic. So uh, if anyone has some mnemonic to help me remember that, put in the comments, please. So they did that. So they also, the bartender they were talking to uh, offered to uh, send one of them a text if they heard anything. So there was a phone number exchanged and stuff. They decided to okay, let's um, let's split up and have a talk. Uh, I'll go. Uh, one of them just went, I think, straight home. Yeah, uh, and one of them, Yen uh, uh, went straight home. Leo went to the library. So Yen uh, was walking. I'm going to tell this as I did it uh, because. When you're DMing stuff like this, where this party split, jump between spotlights. It's anything else is going to hurt a lot. So Leo went to the library, had some talks, heard some information. That's fine. Yen packed the computer uh, down, got the dog, started walking away, and in an alley. They noticed that suspicious guy from earlier, walking towards them, holding a quite big rock, and started running. Oh, well, we had a little bit of a fight scene there, and luckily they got away and they started running. Open chapter 7 of your Keeper's Rulebook. Now, Leo uh, was in the library and did some roles, it was fine, they um, fucked up their own library use role, luckily they... Uh, talked to the librarian and they helped like they got the search query and they were like yeah we can do some searches of our inventory and i'll send you an email with like some pdfs and scans of stuff uh, of it because librarians and not are pretty pretty good pretty great yeah um so Yeah, and he, uh, he was in a chase. He got to fucking run through crowds of people, fucking slide. There was a large truck. I knew, I know, uh, particularly, like, uh, intersection that they were through, and it's a T-intersection, and trucks often come out from this way and have to do turns. So, um, Yen and their dog went under. And on the other side was a police officer who saw that and was just, what? And through some, a great log roll, actually. Like, I couldn't fast talk, it could have been, but they weren't trying to, like, cheat. They just honestly stated, there's a bad guy trying to kill me, chasing me. Please help me. And I knew this officer. I actually have a character sheet for him because I figured they would meet an officer at some point, and I made one. This guy's a himbo. Just beautiful boy. Not too smart, though. He believed Yendo. 
and Jan fucking rain. And the guy chasing them got captured by the police after f- getting stuck in a like crowd of people who were entering a bus and just fucking di- didn't give a shit about him. Uh, and then he crawled under the car and surprise officer just fucking picking him up. Just you're coming with me, kiddo. Down to the station. So, Jan luckily escaped. We cut back to Leo, who returned home. Jan also returned home, but it was like, you both returned home. Leo, um, on your uh, kitchen counter is a letter from your secretary uh, saying that some people went here and there was a note that you should probably call this number. Um... Some Norwegians might have visited the house and wanted to talk to him for reasons unknown. They called together. Jan having one hell of an anxiety attack, Leo being just generally confused and scared. While talking, uh, Leo received the email from the library. There's a bunch of useful information. That yada yada yada. There is some construction going on in the town. On the other side of the river running through the town. It, this is a great town for adventures, by the way. There's a big dramatic bridge going over it. It's, um, and uh, at the bottom there was some sort of glitch. Letters telling them that they need to call or die. So in a three-way call with uh, Yen muted, Leo called Nosu. And had a talk and they were like they got answered by this very sweet um like customer service lady who was just talking in a very nice and light voice and uh, what can i help you yes uh, we would like to talk with you oh and uh, she answered the phone with yes is this leo slot uh, which that's not something customer service people do but uh, you know good customer service people do i'm getting a bit blown out by the light here It's uh, morning, so that's a bit suspicious, though, yeah? So uh, she... So she explained that they would like to talk. They would offer uh, Jan some money. Oh, no. Leo some money. And if uh, Leo took that money and didn't talk about... uh, what they had seen, uh, they would basically have to sign an NDA, uh, and they were invited to do that. And there was a similar message left for Jan. Um, They also asked if this was safe for them, and uh, the customer service lady quite menacingly responded, well, according to this country's laws, we can't actually hurt you ourselves. Uh, (laughs) So it wasn't too reassuring, but you know, it's either that or have people fuck around in your house. So they decided yes. And um, Jan also had received one of these letters. Uh, didn't check his mailbox. Went down, checked and sent in a text. And they just replied, yeah. So this is where I had a talk with my players about, well, we are entering the dungeon now. We are crossing the threshold. We are removing whatever light mood we had. We will talk about this later, but this is where we were like, yeah, we are focusing. So, nine o'clock at night, sun slowly going down. They meet up and uh, they go check the tent camp uh, where the iceberg arrived. Or they just, you know, see what's going on. Uh, the iceberg isn't there. It's, there is like a metal thing, like, a frame covered with top that's meant to look like the iceberg, but the iceberg isn't there. Uh, while they leave, they get to the bridge to the other side of the river where they have to find the warehouse. Um, but uh, they noticed that they were being followed by a cat who, while they were like, they like animals. One of them's wet, one of them has a cute dog. It's nice. Uh, they noticed that it just looks at them and just 
stops and walks away. They start cl- crossing this bridge and it's getting darker and darker and like slowly they get a shock as the like um, lampposts slowly like turn on one by one as they walk. And they arrive at this like empty warehouse complex. They were told that it's uh, the only warehouse that wasn't under construction. Uh, Nozu was getting a bunch of warehouses built and one of them was finished first for the headquarters uh, while the others were still getting worked on. Um, and the warehouses are like completely out to the water so they couldn't walk around so they had to go like through the center of this and the players got paranoid uh, Yen, the photogra- photographer pulled out his tripod um, Leo had gone into his secretary's desk and found a pepper spray um, and they like pulled this out and Yen noticed that there were security cameras which is nice but they were also cut so Leo pulled out his phone and started recording it, like put it in the back pocket so that it would get some video and audio just to prove we are here. Like in case we die, there's some evidence. And they slowly move towards the one building that's open. And it has like keypad and it's unlocked, which is surprisingly, uh, so it's quite surprising. Um, and they open the door. And after like 10 centimeters, it stops and does move any further. Or like there's something against it. it can move, but like when you open a door and there's a bag behind it. So um, Leo picks out his phone and looks in with the camera on and looks on the screen and sanity loss due to mangled dead bodies. Jan puts phone back. Oh, Leo puts phone back, closes his door and looks at Jan and says. Mm, we ain't going in there. Then they hear screams of help in there. And they start fucking running. Then we enter combat. The first thing in combat they hear is a guy falling off the roof. Some guy has been sitting on the roof and he's not the only one up there because he got, he moved stomach downwards like a meter up and did a flip and like landed on his back on the ground uh, and one of his arms definitely said uh, so that, that's a bad day and then some sort of other humanoid appeared up there and Yen got a spear in his lower back I rolled a zero one. one I did the lowest critical damage I could and was very close to killing Yen luckily I didn't that would have been sad and then the thing jumped onto Leo. Now, this is where Yen has his first <laughs> turn of combat. Has just not passed out. Slowly get up with a spear poking out of his back. Like, just takes the tripod and tries to fucking hit this thing. Fails miserably. Luckily, the thing doesn't manage to fight back. So, like, he just hits the thing in the face and just turns and stares at him. And then from down there, Leo just pulls out the pepper spray and sprays this thing in the eyes. And it seems to be some sort of humanoid, but very like muscular and has some sort of weird growth on the like right side of the chest. And uh, luckily the pepper spray works. And then they hear, as a dart pokes out of its neck, the guy who had fallen off the roof slowly sat up with a broken arm. He had a tranquilizer gun wearing a black mask because he was breaking in somewhere. Um, and just looks at the people and just, are you with news? or are you against him? And the players, considering, hear people arriving to check on the warehouse from behind so they uh, they very eloquently get said we, we are against Nosu um, and this weird mask dude walks over to this unconscious body picks it up with this one good arm and starts dragging it into the house just walking past the bodies um, Yan did lose some sanity in there having to walk past the bodies themselves um, and they got in 
while he was picking up that body, uh, Leo did perform first aid on Jan. Um, but hasn't gotten a chance to do medicine yet, which will happen next session. As when they got in the boat and started leaving was when the session ended. Uh, due to me having just some body problems. Just my body was just, your shit now. Uh, and we had dinner and relaxed. And it was fun. The session went great. Everyone had a lot of fun. The mystery wasn't perfect, but we ended on a cliffhanger. And it was just a joy. Like, it was just fucking fun. Um, it helps that one of the players I've played with a lot and is my partner and the other player has DM'd before and is just great at role-playing and uh, throwing people bones and being like, hey, what is your character thinking? I am very lucky to have great players. So let's do a bit of a self-evaluating because that just sounds great. Could, it couldn't have gone better. It could have. But let's look at what went really great. Chases are so fun. Chases are just... Chases are just the funniest shit in the world. They are just so much fun. It gets really tense and the mechanics for it are great. Just, if you haven't tried out the Call of Cthulhu chase rules, do it. Also, I think Call of Cthulhu 7e does great is push rolls. Push rolls are wonderful. Because it lets them fail without actually failing. And then I get to apply consequences to if they really want to try harder and then they fail, then they know shit's really not good. It's wonderful and it gives great dharma because the first role is just, okay, I tried to do this. You really can't because of this or this or this. So I put another obstacle in front of them. Good. Okay. Are you willing to risk your ass to do this? Often the answer is yes and often consequences happen. It's great. I'm also pretty good with atmosphere. Um, that's the third point. I'm, that's really fun, and I enjoy seeing the part of why I write music and stuff like that is because I like inflicting emotions on people. That's pretty much it. That's why I love art in general, because art is like the craft of making people feel things. And atmosphere is a really fun way to do it. It's I get immediate feedback from them seeing... What gets them going? What like what? What do they notice? What like what do they like? Well, at and stuff like that. Especially the cat worked wonderfully, and uh, like lamppost turning on, describing humidity in random places. Like it was great. Also, I had great players. They are fucking great. And what helped was that was um. There's a role-playing game called Cool Divinity or something. I don't remember. I have the PDF, bought it, and read it. Because it's... Have, I don't know if I'll play the game, but it has some really interesting tips for running horror. Uh, one of the things is a horror contract that it um, suggests. And basically there are two questions. Um, like, there are some stuff with... Well, when uh, the horror has to escalate, like you are here to get scared and have fun and having fun means getting scared, right? Uh, and humor is great, but when we have crossed the threshold, as we did with the bridge, we stopped making jokes because it wasn't fitting for the characters. Like, of course, characters could make jokes themselves to deal with the stress, but it was more like, out of character, let's focus on this. When we were investigating and stuff, we could make jokes and like Nosferatu fan fiction, right? But when we were in tense situations, we wouldn't. And that was planned because we had to talk about this. Uh, we also established some boundaries um, where some of us have traumas, me included, that we wouldn't like brought up during the game. So we talked about that and we established a safe word. What we did beforehand, though, to help with that was talking about what scares us. What, what things, like, do we like seeing in horror? What, like, gets us going? What do we just see and go, like, that's cool, I want to investigate that, right? Um, some stuff like weird communication from the other side. Um, 
like ghosts, uh, stuff like that. Um, I have the list somewhere and I'm not bringing it out right now. Because that's what my players want. Uh, that's their secrets. Ask your players what they want. So that was so important. For normal role-playing games like d d it's not that necessary. For horror, fucking, you have to do establishing of interest. Like, I find it necessary in D&D &D just to ensure everyone has fun. Horror, you do it to ensure that no one has, like, doesn't get hurt. Like, we are exploring deep themes that can hurt, like, be careful. Uh, Treat your players with respect, and they will treat you with respect. We we are all very open about our mental health and stuff like that, so it helps that we can talk about that. Um, for example, I don't really involve homophobia, because I'm pansexual, and that just... That hurts, because I have experienced that. I mm, don't like that in my game. Also... Whoever fucking wrote Call of Cthulhu, there's a word that's shorter than he or she. It's called they. Just, you know, putting it out there. <laughs> M Magic the Gathering did it for a while and it fucking drew me up the fucking bend. Uh, just, they. It worked so well. No. Uh, <laughs> I'll get off my uh, soapbox. What went bad? I don't know the rules. Good, yeah. This is only the second Call of Cthulhu thing I've run. I make mistakes. That's okay. I can... I can wing it. I, I have some GM experience. I can. But... It sucked. Uh, during the chase, I had to look up some stuff, and what I did now was go into the back of the Call of Cthulhu book. There are some great appendices uh, with, like... Um with just small, like, overviews of the rules. Um, for example, like, page uh, 419 is just a summary of the magic rules. Uh, that's really good. And the 418 is, like, the part of madness table. So I have printed almost all of those out, so I have them in a binder that I can look at rather easily. I had the same with the combat flow charts. I printed a lot of this beforehand, but... The chase rules, I wasn't expecting to use them, even though I loved them a lot, even before this. Um, I have always loved chase rules, actually. Like, th that was my favorite thing from the Dungeons & Dragons uh, DMG, but I've never used it. Woe is me. Woe is me. Um, so I have started writing things down. I noticed I had to look this up. We're printing that out uh, for myself. I also printed out rules sheets for the players so that they had small things to look at. I would love to put it in the description, but most of it is actually from the book. I haven't made compilations, just pages from the book printed out. Uh, no, real good book. Um, also a bad thing I did. So I have read a lot of Call of Cthulhu scenarios just to get going, and also because a guy called Seth Skokowski does some great videos on them. So I have a lot of information from it. And a lot of them have a very direct hook. Your uncle died and gave you a mention, or you are hired to do this thing. And I have always found that awkward. I, do, I don't start d d campaigns in a tavern. I don't. I actually think I started this one in a tavern, though. Yeah, I did that, but only to subvert expectations and because I had things in place. I don't like stereotypical starts, so I just started and assumed these players are going to investigate this thing. And they were. My players were great, and they bid on everything I had. A couple of days before the adventure, I realized, wait, they aren't going to necessarily break into this warehouse. Maybe I should just, like, have the evil guys invite them in, and I had both parts be an option. That was good. If not, I would have had to make that up on the fly. Players need encouragement. I think they need less, need less now as the, play, the characters are in here and are engaged and on the rails of the story train, which that's, uh, that's a bit thing to say. But 
it's easy to start. You can do a less like direct start where there is to investigate a house, but you are going to need to find a way to motivate the player characters, even if your players are great, which mine are. Mine are. Also, I need to get better at incorporating handouts at just actually making them because I'm working on these mysterious things and putting clues in places and I need to get better at because handouts are great. It adds so much to the atmosphere and I really need to get better at making them. Um, and that's part of what I'm doing in my pardon right now. Um, so, <laughs> Wait, this is procrastinating from making handouts, isn't it? Oh. Whoops. Yikes. But it was a lot of fun. Because we were there to have fun. And we had expectations managed. Oh, also I think that I did, but character creation takes for fucking ever if you haven't um, done it before. Even if you have done it before. It takes me quite a bit, actually. And there were other people who had to make the decision. To, it took like two hours for two people. And they learned a lot. And we had some great talks about their motivations and um, setting up stuff. But it took a while. Your intro session should be quick and sweet. I had more planned for this session. But uh, that's why we ended on a cliffhanger. Should we end this video on a clip? Call of Cthulhu is fun. Establish boundaries and what actually scares them. That's the greatest tip I can ask your players what fucking scares them and then incorporate it. Ask your players what was fun and incorporate it. This is collaborative, but it's also very lonely. So when you can get advice from your players take it i cannot wait for the next session i feel like that's the greatest thing to put here i planned a great i have planned a great adventure for it i cannot fucking wait i am excited goodbye internet <laughs>